The false attribution fallacy is appealing to an irrelevant, unqualified, unidentified bias or fabricated source in support of an argument. Historically, the use of this fallacy was in the attribution of religious or spiritual experiences to outside higher sources rather than an internal psychological process. An example, but professor, I got all these facts from a program I saw on TV once. I can't remember the name of it right now. Obviously, without a credible, verifiable source, the argument or claim being made by the student is very weak. Another example. I had this book that proved that leprechauns were real and had been empirically verified by scientists, but I lost it, and I forget the name of it or who the author was. I read this book can hardly serve as proof of an event as potentially significant as the discovery of leprechauns, empirically verified, in fact, by science. While it might be the case that the person telling the story really does remember reading such a book, it could also very well be that he's simply fabricating this book. In either case, it is fallacious to accept the claim that leprechauns are real and have been empirically verified by science solely on the basis of his argument. The logical form is that claim X is made, source Y, a fake or unverifiable source, is used to verify claim X, therefore claim X is true. Two more examples. Of course I believe that the kids of gay couples should be banned from LDS membership. I heard President Nelson say in a talk in January of 2016 that it's a revelation from God. Or, Joseph Smith says that the righteous will gather in Independence, Missouri to greet the second coming of Jesus Christ. There are plenty of quotes that are circulated ad infinitum on social media that can't be traced to the famous figures who allegedly said them, or that the famous figures have in fact even plagiarized them from others. Here's a couple of examples. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Who said that? John F. Kennedy, yes, he said it, but Kennedy plagiarized it from George St. John's, his headmaster at the Choate School in Connecticut. How about this one? No other success in life can compensate for failure in the home. Yes, that was David O. McKay, one-time president of the LDS Church. However, he lifted it from Benjamin Disraeli, the first Earl of Beaconsfield, 1804 to 1881, who said, no other success in public life can compensate for failure in the home. The fallacy of the lie. A discussion of false attribution begs the question, is a lie a fallacy? Well, yes and no. A lie is a statement that's made knowing that it's not conformable to fact. The one who makes the statement is aware that they're not telling the truth. A fallacy is a reasoning error. The one who commits a fallacy can be aware of it or not. If they are not aware of it, I'd call it rather a reasoning error. However, if they are aware of the fallacy and they're trying to convince others of something, then in fact they're being deceitful and possibly lying. Nevertheless, even though our mothers taught us not to lie, there are times when lying is the best course of action. Plato declared in his Republic that rulers of a just society must on occasion engage in what he referred to as the noble lie to promote social harmony among the masses. Clearly the art of deception is more nuanced than it might seem at first blush. The times when lying is appropriate range from innocent and inconsequential to profound and impactful. From when your spouse asks you if these genes make her butt look large to answering the SS officer who asks you if you're hiding Jews in your attic. How about this guy? Elder Dunn was an outstanding athlete in school, participating in baseball, football, basketball, golf, and track. He also played professional baseball for four years with the St. Louis Cardinals. When I was a younger teenager wanting to pursue the athletic field, I was moving along with uh, relative ease and with some accomplishment. The time came when I signed a professional contract. Unfortunately, the world conditions were much more serious than they are now. The whole world was engaged in a conflict, and then the enemy struck us. It became necessary that year to lower the draft to 18, and I turned 18 the very month they lowered it. 
first boat team starts in. They've got about 2,000 yards. This is when the tide is at its height, so you can get as far ashore as you possibly can. Well, the first boat team went about 1,200 yards before they hit the shore. The whole beach opened up. We don't know how anybody could stay alive. And one craft after the other was hit, and it was scattering American soldiers in the water. <whistles> Second flare goes off. Next boat goes in. Same thing. Third, fourth, fifth, sixth. Nobody's getting ashore. Makes you ponder and wonder. Now it comes time for the seventh wave, and that's mine. <whistles> flare goes off, and in goes the boat team. And it's just kind of eerie sitting there watching that boat go up and down. You can see the palm trees getting a little bigger. Your heart's pounding. Then all of a sudden, the whole shoreline opens up, zeroing in on you. Now it's each hour plus one. The tide's starting to come out. It, it exposes a large coral reef, and our LCVP, LCVP can't get over it. It sticks on the coral reef. And the Navy gets excited. They drop the front and say, get out of here, you're drawing fire. We jump in the water, the water's chest high. You gotta hold your rifle over your head. Muzzle drops in the water, that's salt water. It'll blow up on you when you fire. Did you ever try to run in water up to your chest, loaded down? You don't move very fast. And the enemy starts to pick you up. And you're pushing with the butt of your rifle the dead bodies and wounded bodies of your friends and associates you've been training with. The coral is so sharp, it cuts the boots off your feet, and your feet are starting to bleed like mincemeat, and you're trying to get ashore. And I was one of the first ashore that morning, and I dug my first foxhole with my fingernails, and I crawled in it. And just as I crawled into that mucky hole, an ambu gun opened up. It shoots about 700 rounds a minute. And it went down my right arm and took off my identification bracelet. And I rolled over and started to talk to Heavenly Father. And he answered me. Brother Dunn's lies, and they were lies, were gratuitous. With the goal, I would suspect, being self aggrandizement. There are myriad examples of out-and-out -out lies being told by Mormon prophets and apostles, but to me perhaps the most heinous, because my parents were converts from the British Isles, was John Taylor's words to investigators questioning whether the rumors of Mormon polygamy were true. We are accused here of polygamy, and actions the most indelicate, obscene, and disgusting, such that none but a corrupt and depraved heart could have contrived these things are too outrageous to admit or believe. I shall content myself by reading our views of chastity and marriage from a work published by us containing some of our articles of faith. The Doctrine and Covenants on page 330 says, Insomuch as this church of Jesus Christ has been reproached with the crime of fornication and polygamy, we declare that we believe that one man should have but one wife and one woman should have one husband, except in the case of death. When John Taylor told this filthy lie, he had 12 polygamous wives who bore him 26 children. The following is a list of those wives and the children that they eventually bore him. You might be aware of Elder Dallin Oak's admonition to those lacking a testimony to simply fake it. Another way to seek a testimony seems astonishing when compared with the methods of obtaining other knowledge. We gain our strength in a testimony by bearing it. Someone even suggested that some testimonies are better gained on the feet bearing them than on the knees praying for them. And that was from uh, a talk he gave called Testimony in General Conference April of 2008. But as your words impact on those who hear them, isn't that tantamount to bearing false witness? Is not Oak's admonition to missionaries to mouth a fake testimony instructing them to deceive other people? Apostle Todd Christofferson tells the story of a returned missionary who was struggling with his faith after learning of the several differing versions of Joseph Smith's first vision. I was shocked to hear him say that he didn't know that the Book of Mormon was true. How is it possible that a faithful, successful missionary could have not received that witness? President, sisters, please don't let this happen with any of your missionaries. Be sure that each one of them does what's necessary so that he or she does not leave the mission field 
without a sure conviction of the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon and all it implies. Christofferson's concern is that missionaries do not leave their missions without having gained a testimony of the Book of Mormon, but expresses no concern over the fact that at least some of these missionaries have been asserting the truthfulness of the book to convince people that the Book of Mormon and therefore Mormonism is true. This type of disregard for integrity isn't new. In 1982, Apostle Boyd K. Packer taught, it is not unusual to have a missionary say, how can I bear testimony until I get one? How can I testify that God lives, that Jesus is the Christ, and that the gospel is true if I don't have such a testimony? Would that not be dishonest? Oh, if I could only teach you this one principle. A testimony is to be found in the bearing of it. Somewhere in your quest for spiritual knowledge, there's a leap of faith, as the philosophers call it. It is that moment when you've gone to the edge of the light and stepped into the darkness to discover the way is lighted ahead for just a footstep or two. Again, in Packard's example, the missionary did not have a confirmation that what he was testifying was true, but rather than addressing the missionary's question about the honesty of his bearing of a false testimony, Packer advises him to just fake it, and hopefully it, a true testimony, will come. In philosophy and logic, the liar's paradox or antimony of the liar is a statement of a liar that they're lying. For instance, if I declare I am lying, and I'm indeed lying, then I'm telling the truth, which means I just lied. The pervasiveness of bullshit. One of the most distinguishing features of our culture and society is that there is bullshit everywhere, and each of us contributes his or her share. Bullshit is pervasive in education, the arts, and politics, and the media, as well as advertising and, of course, religion. It would seem that there are few organizations so adept with their shovels as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Bullshit misleads and therefore bullshit harms. There is a lot at stake here. What happens to a society when its members become indifferent or worse, oblivious to the notion of truth? Well, you know, whenever you're exposed to advertising in this country, you realize all over again that America's leading industry is still the manufacture, distribution, packaging, and marketing of bullshit. <laughs> High-quality bullshit. World-class designer bullshit, to be sure. Hospital-tested, clinically proven bullshit. But bullshit nonetheless. And it always amuses me that so many people seem to think that bullshit only comes from certain sources. You know, advertising, politicians, salesmen. Not true. Bullshit is everywhere. Bullshit is rampant. Parents are full of shit. Teachers are full of shit, clergymen are full of shit, law enforcement people are full of shit. The entire country is completely full of shit. In fact, this country was founded by a group of slave owners who told us that all men are created equal. That is what's known as being stunningly, stunningly full of shit. Some examples of bullshit. Verb. Elder Holland can bullshit all day long and his young missionary audience wouldn't know the difference. Or as a noun, I'm sick and tired of hearing the same old bullshit from President Kimball. The origins of bullshit. We need to understand what bullshit is and where it comes from and why so much of it is produced. Bullshit is not altogether a modern invention, as Carl T. Bergstrom and Jevon D. West point out in their book Calling Bullshit. In one of his Socratic dialogues, Plato complained that the philosophers known as the sophists are not interested in what is actually true, but are just interested in winning arguments. In other words, they were bullshit artists. Machiavelli, in discussing political deception, wrote in 1521 that for a long time I have not said what I believe, nor do I even believe what I say, and if indeed I do happen to tell the truth, I hide it amongst so many lies that it's hard to find. While not attaching the label bullshit, the 16th century philosopher Michel de Montaigne, in his essay of liars, expressed its essential character. 
when he wrote, If falsehood had, like truth, but one face only, we should be on better terms. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, two of the earliest citations for the word bullshit come from the British writer Wyndham Lewis and the American essayist E.E. E. Cummings. But it was perhaps T.S. Eliot who wrote the word into common parlance with the publication of his poem entitled The Triumph of Bullshit in 1910. While the original attribution is unclear, Jefferson, Twain, or Churchill, it said that a lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is still putting its pants on. I think the earliest form of it came from the brilliant Irish satirist Jonathan Swift, who wrote in 1710 that falsehood flies and that truth comes limping after it. In today's internet culture, bullshit travels with remarkable and terrifying speed. It's as if we're moving into a post-truth age. We've witnessed a U.S. president openly lie on a daily basis or minimally not know what is true and what's not. There are different types of bullshit, old school bullshit. An example being upon further documentation and clinical appraisal of said patient's symptoms and conducting a comprehensive examination of his otolaryngological region. The fundamental diagnosis suggests a case of communal viral rhinitis. In other words, the patient has a cold. Old school bullshit or gobbledygook is inflated jargon cluttered verbiage that fails to communicate clearly. But there's also new school bullshit. An example being the theta state has a brain wave cycle of four to seven per second. It is clearly in a realm that is beyond time and space constraints. Additionally, it has been validated by a static electroencephalogram. Further, it has been shown that a practitioner can automatically bring a patient to that same theta state. The technique is at the cutting edge of healing modalities, supporting our current rapid modern day existence. It utilizes the fluid energy of the universe to create the life that one wants to live. New school bullshit is effective because most of us don't feel qualified to challenge quantitative data or formulatic calculus that we don't understand. Too often the scientific or pseudoscientific jargon the new school bullshitter employs can fool us into believing something that's false. The information age in which we live certainly means we come across more bullshit in a week than our grandparents likely witnessed in a year. Straight talk is not in vogue. We seem to choose a form of doublespeak in which we communicate in a way that misrepresents or obscures the truth. It combines both sense and nonsense into a deliberate effort on the part of the sender to conceal the true meaning of what he or she is saying. In some cases, doublespeak is used to soften the impact of what the communication or message is. But more often, it's used to camouflage the truth, and therefore, it's a form of bullshit. Euphemisms are a type of doublespeak that attempts to make certain situations seem more palatable or soften a blow. They're usually evasive, but not often malicious. For example, calling someone's home quaint is a nicer way than saying small. Here are some examples. Alternative facts rather than lies. Ill-advised instead of bad idea. Passed away rather than died. Well-off rather than rich. Thrifty instead of cheap. Developing country instead of impoverished nation, golden years instead of old age, sleeping with rather than having sex with, bathroom tissue instead of toilet paper, mobile homes rather than trailers, occasional irregularity rather than constipation, right-sizing rather than firing, disadvantaged rather than poor, substandard housing rather than slums, a peculiar people rather than a weird people, a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints instead of Mormon. What's the difference between a liar and a bullshitter? Well, Henry Frankfurt said, a liar knows the truth and is trying to convince us of something different. A bullshitter either doesn't know the truth or doesn't care and is just trying to be persuasive. Here's a passage from a letter that Sigmund Freud wrote to his fiancée in 1884. So yesterday I gave a lecture, despite a lack of preparation. I spoke quite well and without any hesitation, which I ascribed to the cocaine I had taken beforehand. I told about my discoveries in brain anatomy, all very difficult things, and the audience certainly didn't understand them. 
but all that matters is that I gave the impression that I understood them. Thankfully, even the pandemic has not been able to slow the onward march. We're in the midst of, of incredible growth, staggering growth in the church. It's the single biggest problem we have. It's the best problem we could have, but it's the biggest. Uh, we, we are reeling under the implications of the growth that we have in this church. But a week ago Thursday, we created 15 stakes. Um, and we're doing that masamenos every, every week. Some have asserted that more members are leaving the church today and that there is more doubt and unbelief than in the past. This is simply not true. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has never been stronger. The number of members removing their names from the records of the Church has always been very small and is significantly less in recent years. While the Church publishes worldwide membership numbers of about 16 million people, Camorra.com reports that less than half of those the Church counts even identify themselves as Mormon. Assuming that the number of active members is lower than those who don't even want to be called Mormon, hardly a heroic assumption, the actual functional membership of the LDS Church, even ignoring record resignations, is more re realistically to be between 3 and 5 million men, women, and children, and it's a revolving door. And FYI, those data also contradict Elder Holland's statement that the church saw double-digit stakes being created pretty much every week, and that the past week it, they were able to create 15. The week he claims that there were 15 stakes added, there were actually zero. Uh, from March through July of the year that he gave this speech, the church created on average just one per week. Again, a liar knows the truth and tries to convince us of something different. A bullshitter either doesn't know the truth or doesn't care and is simply trying to be persuasive. The question is, do these men know the truth and are trying to convince us of something different or do they not know the truth or simply don't care and are just trying to be persuasive? In other words, are they liars or bullshitters? There are numerous examples of where Mormon prophets and apostles knowingly lied. Joseph Smith was certainly lying when he said, What a thing it is for a man to be accused of committing adultery and having seven wives when I can only find one. I'm the same man and as innocent as I was 14 years ago, and I can prove them all perjurers. This comes from the History of the Church, Volume 6, page 411. Joseph Smith made this statement preaching from the stand to LDS members in Nauvoo on Sunday, May 26, 1844. At the time, he had secretly taken over 25 plural wives. In this example, Smith knew the truth and was trying to convince his followers of something different. Bruce R. McConkie was certainly lying when he said that the Adam-God theory was never taught in the church, when he knew the opposite was the case. You talk about teaching false doctrines and being damned. Here is a list of false doctrines that if someone teaches, he will be damned. And there is not one of these that I've ever known to be taught in the church. But I'm giving you this list for a perspective because of what will follow. Then he goes on to list the doctrines he says were never taught in the church. Teaching that God is a spirit. Teaching that salvation comes from grace alone. Teaching original guilt. Teaching infant baptism. Teaching predestination. Teaching that revelation and miracles have ceased and teaching the Adam-God theory. That was in uh, February 19, 1981. Later that same year, McConkie publicly, publicly stated, yes, President Young did teach that Adam was the father of our spirits and all the related things that the cultists ascribed to him. But sometimes it's not quite so clear, as is in the example of Spencer Kimball speaking about masturbation, and I quote, what is more, it too often leads to grievous sin, even to that sin against nature, homosexuality. For done in private, it evolves often into mutual masturbation, practiced with another person of the same sex, and hence into total homosexuality. Did Kimball actually believe what he was saying? Or was he just speaking from a position of ignorance as he attempted to convince or influence his youthful audience? Or how about Brigham Young, when speaking of the blacks said, 
Shall I tell you the law of God regarding the African race? If the white man who belongs to the chosen seed mixes his blood with the seed of Cain, the penalty under the law of God is death on the spot. This will always be so. In this example, Smith no doubt believed what he was saying, but arguably was speaking out of bigotry and prejudice in an attempt to persuade his fellow Mormons to adopt his hateful beliefs. The two former statements by Kimball and Young, as well as the clip of Holland, in which he claimed that the church was experiencing incredible growth, indeed creating double-digit stakes pretty much every week, 15 in the past week alone, comes close to what I would call bullshit. Remember the definition of the bullshitter. A bullshitter either doesn't know the truth or doesn't care and is just trying to be persuasive. The bullshitter is someone who has no problem saying things that are not true to get the admiration of others. The bullshitter frequently gives misleading information, offers excuses, and when necessary provides bogus facts to lend support to what they're trying to sell. Why do people so often choose to bullshit? Well, if you're out and out lying, you get caught, you'll lose the respect of friends and family. You might even get sued in the court of law, or at least become the subject of gossip. With all of these potential penalties, it's often better to simply try to mislead people without lying outright. It's called paltering. Paltering differs from lying by omission, simply omitting relevant information. Lying, on the other hand, is a sin of commission, the active use of false statements. Paltering is common in negotiations, where negotiators prefer to palter rather than to lie. Paltering offers a level of plausible deniability. Think Bill Clinton's. It depends upon what the meaning of the word is, is. The definition of paltering, which is an intransitive verb, is to act insincerely or deceitfully, to equivocate. This distinct form of deception is the use of sly tactics to get a better deal during negotiations or when seeking to influence other people, often making statements that are technically true but purposeful, purposefully skewed to mislead the other side. Paltering is the active use of truthful statements to influence a target's beliefs by giving a false or distorted impression. Some people seem to use this strategy because in their own minds they've convinced themselves that they're actually telling the truth. The church, in attempting to inoculate its members, gives them nuggets of true church history that references controversial issues. But the fragments they choose are never the damning snippets that would give one pause. This is paltering. The church essays are a masterful example of paltering, as is the church's latest video entitled, Now You Know, aimed at those members who have or will come across myriad problems and inconsistencies with the histiosity of the church detailed on the internet. 10 fragments of the scrolls were found in the archives of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. These papyrus fragments were subsequently transferred back to the church. One fragment contains a partial copy of a drawing included in the Book of Abraham called Facsimile 1, which is currently on display in Salt Lake City. Egyptologists have translated these papyrus fragments and determined that they don't directly relate to the Book of Abraham. Instead, they contain ancient Egyptian funerary texts. Why did these fragments not contain text from the Book of Abraham? Many researchers believe that Joseph translated the Book of Abraham from portions of the scrolls that are now lost. Others suggest that Joseph's study of the papyri acted as a catalyst for him to receive the Book of Abraham by revelation. One thing is certain. The translation of the Book of Abraham was not a typical translation. It came through inspiration from God. Now you know, or do you? This video also fails to mention that Smith had actually declared that it was written by the hand of Abraham and that Joseph or one of his associates penciled in a man's head where the head of a jackal should be. While they say that many researchers believe that Joseph translated the book of Abraham from portions of the scrolls that are now lost, they fail to mention that there's no evidence that any portions that have been lost contain anything relating to Abraham, let alone any mention of the thousand years between the age of the scrolls and when Abraham supposedly lived. 
They also fail to mention that the many researchers they speak of are exclusively Mormon researchers. And conveniently, they fail to mention the fact that Smith's translation of the characters found on facsimile 1 also appear in the same order in his notebook, supposedly relating to Abraham, but which have also been shown by those people with a knowledge of Egyptian are absolute nonsense. The church is also guilty of the use of implicature. Implicature denotes the act of meaning or implying one thing, but saying something else. For example, suppose you ask me what I think of the new Superman flick, and I say it wasn't terrible, you might infer from that that I didn't think it was too great either. Or if I say, Jack doesn't drink on the job, you might interpret my message as meaning that Jack has a drinking problem, but with a modicum of restraint, so that he refrains at least from the use of alcohol in the workplace, for now. Or if I say, Janet isn't the most responsible mother, you might think I mean that she's a terrible mother. However, if you call me on any of these statements or comments, I can claim innocence. I never said I hated the film, or that Jack was a drunk, or that Janet was a lousy mother. Where'd you get that idea? Let's talk about spotting bullshit. Here's seven tools to help you do that. Everyone else is wrong. This form of bullshit is found in many political organizations and all cults. When you hear that everyone else is wrong except the supreme leader or the prophet, watch out. The Mormon church was built in this premise. In one of Joseph Smith's renditions of his first vision, he learns that all the churches are wrong and an abomination, in fact, in the sight of God. Beware when someone tells you that everyone else is wrong and we're the only people that have the truth. Is it possible? Of course. But do a little critical thinking before you sign over the farm. Here's Dallin Oaks. I'll speak about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as the only true and living church. In doing so, I know I speak against the powerful tide of what is called political correctness. The fashionable opinion of this age is that all churches are true. In truth, the idea that all churches are the same is the doctrine of the Antichrist, illustrated in the Book of Mormon through the account of Korahor. The account was given to teach us a vital lesson in our day. Brigham Young stated repeatedly that the Christian world, so-called, are heathens. As to the knowledge of the salvation of God, Orson Pratt proclaimed, both Catholics and Protestants are nothing less than the whore of Babylon. Any person who shall be so corrupt as to receive a holy ordinance of the gospel from the ministers of any of these apostate churches will be sent down to hell with them unless they repent. President John Taylor stated, Christianity is a perfect pact of nonsense. The devil could not invent a better engine to spread his work than the Christianity of the 19th century. And Bruce R. McConkie stated, Virtually all of the millions of apostate Christendom have abased themselves before the mythical throne of a mythical Christ. And President George Q. Cannon said, After the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was organized, there were only two churches upon the earth. They were known respectively as the Church of the Lamb and the, of God and Babylon. I recently came upon this chart showing that the restored church or restored gospel was never used in the church until after the 1890s. The second tool for spotting bullshit, hope is a monkey, get it off your back. Hyperbole is a way of life in advertising. The rule is, it would seem, to overpromise and underdeliver. When something seems too good to be true, it's likely bullshit. Wow, a prince in Nigeria picked me to help him bring $60 million into the country, and for just a few thousand dollars, I'll get 10% of it? Or, new skin is an easy way to make a fortune. It has a proven formula, and Mitt Romney backs it. I know I can make it big time. Or, if I obey God's spokesman and sacrifice my life for the cause, I'll get 17 virgins in paradise. Number three, gaslighting. Gaslight isn't just the title of an old movie with Charles Boyer. Gaslighting is a particularly venomous form of bullshit. The gaslighter asks you to deny objective reality and embrace their version of reality. It often involves revisionist history. It can go as far as to cause you to deny your actual memory of an event. 
Gaslighting is one of the most salient features of modern Mormonism. It is one thing for the church to disavow the racist doctrines and policies advanced in the past, but when it attempts to minimize them, it's engaging in a form of bullshit. When the Mormon church tries to paint Joseph and Emma as a devoted, loving, and faithful couple, or suggests that a 37-year-old Joseph Smith marrying a 14-year-old girl is not uncommon in the day, it's bullshit. Here's my Mormon gaslighter's prayer. That didn't happen. And if it did, it wasn't that bad. And if it was, it's no big deal. And if it is, it's not my fault. And if it was, I didn't mean it. And if I did, you deserved it. Number four is the conversational pivot. This is where a person stops answering your question and starts answering their own, or switches to talking about a more comfortable topic of their own choosing. Politicians are great at this. That's a great question you raise about what I do to decrease violence in our inner city. I've always supported more funding for our schools, and in particular, better salaries for our teachers. They recognize, as I do, that young people need a bright future. A good teacher can be a role model for our kids. It's rare that a Mormon apostle will take questions that are not vetted carefully and examined and approved. However, on those rare, very rare occasions when someone manages to get a question through, we often observe the apostle pivot. In the following clip, even though Elder Bednar had advanced notice of the question and thus time to prepare a response, we still see an example of pivoting. Ready? Yes. How can homosexual members of the church ¿Cómo pueden los miembros de la iglesia homosexuales live and remain steadfast in the gospel? vivir y permanecer fieles en el evangelio? First, I want to change the question. Primero quiero cambiar la pregunta. There are no homosexual members of the church. No hay miembros de la iglesia homosexuales. We are not defined by sexual attraction. No somos definidos por uh, atracción sexual. We are not defined by sexual behavior. No se nos define por la, nuestra conducta sexual. We are sons and daughters of God. Nosotros somos hijos e hijas de The fifth tool for spotting bullshit is when someone tries to confuse correlation with causation. With all the sets of data in the world, you don't have to look that hard to find some coincidental correlations. Number six is bullshit graphs. Watch out for graphs and charts, as there are so many ways it can be constructed to mislead. Specifically look for incorrect proportion charts. Here the proportions of the chart fail to match the data being presented. Measurement scales that show only a small fraction of the total value. This can be used to deliberately overemphasize small changes. Check publication dates. Graphs are typically used to display time-related information. A skilled bullshitter may try to mislead by using old data. Likewise, check the source. Is it legit? Pay attention to colors. Bright or vivid colors draw the eye to certain parts of a graph or chart, which can distract from other more relevant aspects of the data. And number seven, lies, damn lies, and bullshit statistics. Bullshitters love statistics because they're among the easiest things that can be twisted to suit their purposes. As well, since they look complicated and involve math, uh, they can be highly influential. By presenting statistical data in a one-sided or biased way, the bullshitter hopes that the audience will interpret their statistics without questioning the methods behind the collection and presentation of the data. Also, unless you're well-versed in statistical analysis, you're prone to make numerous errors let me give you a few. Let me use as an example the explosive growth that my Letter to an Apostle website has experienced. Have a look at this chart, this cumulative chart of the number of people viewing the website. Are you impressed? Well, hold on, Kimasabi. Let's go back and actually look at the data. What I showed you was a cumulative chart. And of course, over time, it increases. It can't decrease. But if we look at the actual data, a different picture emerges. As you can see here, this is for one month. 
We start off with the first day, maybe 51 people viewing it, then it drops down to 50, then it goes up to maybe 55, and then down again. Then it goes up quite a bit, but then it drops down even further. We have another good day, and then it really hits the, the tank for about a week in a row. Then we climb up again, that drops down. Then we have a good day, and that drops. In other words, the data indicates a different picture than the cumulative chart. Here's an overlay of the cumulative chart with, with the actual daily views of the website. Quite a different picture. Here's Tom Cook playing the very same game, talking about the sales of iPods. And again, this is cumulative. Compare that to the next chart, where like in my example, we also show on this chart the quarterly increases in iPad or iPod sales. And as you can see, a little bit lackluster. There are various forms of statistical bias too. There's a selection bias, uh, which is introduced by the selection of individuals, groups of data for analysis in such a way that proper randomization is not achieved. There's also sampling bias, which is a systematic error due to the non-random sampling of a population causing some members of the population to be less likely to be included than others, resulting in a biased sample. There's volunteer bias, offering further threats to the validity of a study, as these participants may have intrinsically different characteristics from the target population of the study. One mistake that people often make who are unfamiliar with statistics is the base rate fallacy. Let me give you an illustration. In a city of a million inhabitants, let's say there's 100 terrorists and 999,900 non-terrorists, thus the base rate probability of a randomly selected inhabitant of that city being a terrorist is 0.0001, and the base rate probability of an inhabitant being a non-terrorist is 0.9999. Well, in an attempt to apprehend the terrorists, the city has installed facial recognition cameras all across the city. But the software has two failure rates, both of 1%. The false negative rate. If the camera scans a terrorist, an alarm will sound 99% of the time, but it will fail to go off 1% of the time. The false positive rate. If the can camera scans a non-terrorist, the, the alarm will not sound 99% of the time, but will, in error, sound 1% of the time. Now, suppose that the inhabitants of the city trigger the alarm. What are the chances that the person is a terrorist? In other words, what is the probability that a terrorist has been correctly identified by the sounding of the alarm? Well, someone making the base rate fallacy would infer that there's a 99% chance that the detected person is a terrorist. Although this inference seems to make sense, it's wrong and represents bad reasoning. As the calculations below show, the actual chances that the individual setting off the alarm is of being a terrorist is actually less than 1%, not 99%. Imagine that the city's entire population of 1 million people pass in front of the facial identification camera. 99 of the 100 terrorists will trigger the alarm, and so will 9,999 of the 999,900 non-terrorists Therefore, 10,098 people will trigger the alarm, among which 99 will be terrorists. So, the probability that a person triggering the alarm actually is a terrorist is only 99 in 10,098 instances, which is less than 1%, and very far below the initial guess of 99%. We also have another issue in statistics called the Will Rogers phenomenon, which is obtained when we move an element from one set to another. It raises the average value of both sets. It's based on the original statement attributed to comedian Will Rogers, who said, when the Okies leave Oklahoma and move to California, they raise the average intelligence level in both states. This is actually true. Consider the sets R and S. Set R is 1, 2, 3, and 4, and set S is 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. The arithmetic mean of R is 2.5 and the arithmetic mean of S is 7. However, if 5 is moved from set S to set R, it produces R equals 
1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and s equals 6, 7, 8, 9. Then the arithmetic mean of r increases to 3, and the arithmetic mean of s increases to 7.5. There's also lead time bias, which happens when survival time appears longer because diagnosis was done earlier, for instance, by screening, irrespective of whether the patient lives longer. Lead time is the duration of time between the detection of a disease by screening or perhaps new experimental criteria and its usual clinical presentation and diagnosis. It's the time between early detection of cancer by screening and the time in which diagnosis would normally be found through the appearance of unpleasant symptoms without screening. This is an important factor when evaluating the effectiveness of a specific test. Lead time bias occurs if testing increases the perceived survival time without affecting the course of the disease. The goal of screening is, of course, earlier detection. To diagnose a disease earlier than it would otherwise be possible without screening. Therefore, if screening works, it needs to advance in time the moment of diagnosis. In other words, screening needs to introduce a lead time. However, the lead time itself can bias survival statistics. People with diseases detected by screening appear to have a longer survival time only because screening starts the clock earlier. Or Consider, for instance, a disease where there's no screening. The symptoms result in a diagnosis at age 60 and the patient dies at age 65. This patient lived five years after the diagnosis. Now consider that with screening, the disease is detected when the patient is 55 years of age, but they still die at age 65. They didn't live any longer because of their earlier detection, but they appear to have survived 10 years after the diagnosis or a longer period of time, just simply because the disease was diagnosed five years earlier. Therefore, earlier detection alone is not enough to achieve, achieve longer survival rates. I sim it simply appears that people survive longer with cancer screening when the course of the cancer is the same as in those who are diagnosed later. Now, of course, earlier detection will hopefully lead to treatment alternatives that will lengthen survival. However, lead time bias must be taken into consideration. Detecting bullshit may not change society, but it can have a life-changing impact on you personally. But detection is not enough. You need to call it. If you've listened to my introductory episode on critical thinking, you'll recall that I said that the essence of critical thinking is to one, not take things at face value, and to two, not let emotion sidetrack reason. By asking critical questions to uncover the speaker's agenda, or by seeking to establish the speaker's credentials and credibility, or by asking how they know that what they're saying is true, that is, what evidence do they base their conclusions upon, you can do your part to stop the spread of misinformation and bullshit. Bullshit will continue to pile up around us unless and until we help the bullshitter confront and refocus on reality and evidence. The Mormon church is awash in bullshit. The church has a long history of secrecy and deception. Its leaders have lied when expedient and sadly continue to do so. Uh, the, the church is hiding something that, which we would have to say as Two apostles who have covered the world and know the history of the church and know the integrity of the first presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve from the beginning of time. There has been no attempt on the part in any way of the church leaders trying to hide anything. Look at this one. She buys Ballard's bullshit hook, line, and sinker. These two girls, not so much. In an article published in the Salt Lake Tribune in 2016 entitled, Why Top Mormon Leaders' Private Writings May Never Become Public, it states, If you want to know about Mormon seer stones, secret polygamous wives, divine visions, personal revelations, bank failures and baptisms, callings and excommunications, jail terms and healing miracles, debates over prophetic secession and disagreements about the nature of Zion, they're all there in documents, journals, correspondence and histories published by the LDS Church itself, materials from the first decades of Mormonism. 
in the early 1800s through the end of the 19th century have been scrutinized, analyzed, and criticized from every possible angle and in public. The modern church, not so much. The article explains why whatever prior availability existed with regard to the history of the church, it's being curtailed to a large degree, both in the present and in the future. In the 1980s, assistant church historian Richard E. Turley explains the Utah-based faith began acquiring, or requiring rather, all Mormon general authorities to sign an agreement pledging that any work product, including their journals, speeches, photographs, and other records of enduring value belonging to the, belong to the church's history department for long-term preservation. Does this new protocol comport with Elder Ballard's statement? Greg Prince, who co-wrote David O. McKay and the Rise of Modern Mormonism, is quoted in the article as saying, I view this as counterproductive to the church. Further, the story in the tri tribute suggests that the policy could have a self-censoring effect on apostles, for instance, robbing their retellings of any fr with any frankness, raw details or negative emotions. It could yield sanitized versions of touchy topics, or worse, it could prompt some Mormon leaders to forgo recording their remembrances at all. Respected writer Jana Reese, in an article appearing in the Religious News Service in 2014, reported Dieter Ergdorf, then a member of the LDS First Presidency, telling Mormons that learning about the real struggles and real successes of early church leaders and members is a very faith-promoting process for him. Ergdorf also suggested that Mormons should navigate a middle road, not shying away from the church's history out of fear of what, it might find, what they might find. Statements like this are useful, but like Ergdorf's position in the church's hierarchy, the impact of his opinions, it would seem, have been lessened. I condemn it. I condemn it, yes, as a practice, because I think it is not doctrinal, it is not legal, and this church takes the position that we will abide by the law. We believe in being subject to kings, presidents, rulers, magistrates, in honoring, obeying, and sustaining the law. I condemn it, yes, as a practice, because I think it is not doctrinal, it is not legal, and this church takes the position that we will abide by the law. I still believe that right is right and wrong is wrong. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. It is not doctrinal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. So it's not a large corporation, and the apostles are not the board of directors. The Savior knows people by name. He knows their circumstances, and he directs us in our work uh, we extend a particular welcome to those of you that are uh, participating and attending your first Beneficial Financial Group event. Welcome to the Beneficial Financial Group family. Uh, we would like to take a special moment to honor a number of special guests with us here this evening. Management Corporation, uh, our parent. President Thomas S. Monson, first counselor in the first presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and a former board member of Beneficial Financial Group, and his wife, Frances, President Boyd K. Packer, acting president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, and a former chairman of Beneficial Financial Group. Talk about Mitt Romney. Okay. The man who may well become the most powerful man on earth. Mm -hmm. As a Mormon in the temple, I've been told, he would have sworn an oath to say that he would not pass on what happens in the temple, lest he slit his throat. Is that true? That's not true. That's not true. We do not have penalties in the temple. You used to? We used to. Therefore, he swore an oath saying, I will not tell anyone about the secrets here, lest I slit my throat. Well, the, the, the vow that was made was regarding the ordinance the ordinance of the temple. It sounds Masonic, sir. It sounds Masonic. Well, it's comparable. It's similar to, to, to a, a Masonic uh, relationship. The most, potentially, I, I, the most powerful the, man on the world the date, has sworn an oath, which he meant at the time, whatever it is now, that he must not tell anyone about what he's seen, 
lest he slit his throat.